All right, so I don't know, people on the left, you might want to migrate right, or people on the right might want to migrate <laughs> left, depending on which way you're facing, just so there's not going to be a whole lot going on on the slides. I can draw some stuff, maybe, but I'm, I'm a pretty terrible artist. Um, so first of all, let's just go down, let's start with Kim, just kind of, uh, who are you? Well, we know who you are, but um, tell us a little bit about Previous Next, um, what the hiring situation is, and um, yeah, sure. well, introduction. So Previous Next... Um, we're based in Australia. Uh, we're about 20, 22 staff at the moment. Um, we started about five years ago. Uh, me and myself and Owen Lansbury started the company. Um, I have a programming background, so I've been in uh, software development, web development for about 20 years or so. Um, so was was using uh, you know the, the same tools that we mentioned earlier to cut up files and, and, and use HTML tables and those kinds of things. Um, so my role is a, a technical director, and I do most of the hiring. So I, I, I basically do most of the interviewing um, and, uh, and recruiting for the company. Is it mainly in-house staff or telecommuting or So we're, we're actually a bit of a mix. So we have um, about half of our staff actually work in-house and half are remote. Um, and I think we... Uh, it really depends on, on, the, on the candidate of whether they're going to be suitable to be um, working remotely versus mm. in-house. And uh, certainly we would want to try and find the best talent and we'll, we'll definitely have people work remotely if they're, if, um, if they're a good remote worker. All right, so let me ask primarily how do you look for or find talent? Um, so I think uh, it's, it's pretty much all the, all the top people that we've, we've hired – uh, we've known well in advance of actually hiring, hiring them, and that is through the community, um, both the Australian Drupal community, but also internationally. Um, all of us uh, participate in the in the community. We go to the events, we go to the meetups. Um, most of us speak at at conferences or, or meetups, um, and just that's the, generally the way that we we network. Um, and yeah, okay. So, Steve, let's move on to you. Tell us a little bit about um, you and Wonderkraut, which is pretty unique because you're so spread out. Yeah, uh, we're Europe's largest uh, Drupal agency. There's uh, just over 140 of us in nine countries, so we are quite spread out. Uh, very much represented in the Scandinavian countries, Benelux, Germany, and the UK. Uh, are our key offices. And um, we were formed from the merger of four of Europe's Drupal agencies uh, about two years ago. And then since then, we've just been gradually uh, kind of finding our culture and developing the way that we're going to work. So how do you primarily find Drupal talent? Uh, well, very similar in that the community is very important. Um, a lot of our current staff have come through uh, meeting people at events like DrupalCon um, and also just the small meetups, the Drupal camps and so on. But we're starting to think very much about how we can expand outside of that, uh, partly because, uh, as I was discussing with someone earlier on, uh, all of our businesses are growing at a faster rate than the community itself is, is growing, uh, but also because... Um, we're trying to obviously widen the talent pool and improve diversity. And if we're only recruiting from a fairly narrow group, uh, that's going to be fairly difficult. So we're starting to look at uh, recruiting from outside the Drupal community and skilling up the people that come in with, with Drupal skills. Um, so we're just experimenting with that in London at the moment. We've taken on a, a designer who uh, comes from a web design background, uh, very different types of project. Hadn't previously been allowed by the agencies to work on agile projects and hadn't been allowed to get involved in the code. His job had just been focus on the design. And of course, what we want him to do is take a much more broad view. We want him to learn to code. We want him to learn Drupal uh, and kind of turn him into a, a true front ender uh, of whom Morton could be proud and, um, <laughs> and swear at probably. Um, and, um, <laughs> swear with. <laughs> swear with, swear okay. With. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, so, yeah, so that's quite an experiment for us, but we're really looking at does that sort of thing work and what do we need to do? So it's putting in place a buddy system and a mentoring system. They're, they're quite two quite different things that can support people like that coming into the company uh, and develop that new talent that perhaps wouldn't have otherwise found its way to Drupal. So is your staff primarily um, uh, in-house or telecommuting or a mix? 
Uh, again, one of the interesting things about our culture as a company is that there's a lot of flexibility for all of our country offices to run themselves in the way they feel it fits so that it can fit their local culture uh, and what the team want to do. So some of our offices, uh, for example, Stockholm, they do work from an office, a, a fixed office. Uh, in Helsinki and uh, Munich, there is an office, and a lot of people go there a lot of the time, but they don't have to apart from one day a week, which is the time everyone goes in and uh, hangs out. Um, and in the UK, we have no office at all. Um, we, we have nothing. There's a place the post goes to, um, and there's some hot desks there. It's a co-working space. Uh, but we are very distributed in the UK. So one of our team members in the UK is Lewis Nyman, who's very involved in CoreDev. He uh, now lives in Zurich uh, because his girlfriend got a job there, and so he decided to move with her because his work was flexible. So we do, in the UK, do a lot of distributed working. Um, and that works very well for us, allows us to hire some very talented people, but it requires quite a different skill set um, because there's, there needs to be people who are very, very strong communicators uh, and very good collaborators. So we focus on recruiting on that basis. Okay, thank you. And Mike, I, I don't want to say the same questions, but I will <laughs> say uh, tell us about yourself and, and, and Four Kitchens. Sure. So uh, Mike Manetsky from Four Kitchens. Um, we've been uh, building websites for seven years, and I've, I've been with the company for about two. Um, I was the um, either the second to last or the last employee that was uh, relocated to Austin, um, after which we became a fully distributed company. Um, and that started with one employee in San Diego and now has stretched out to across the United States and um, even to an employee in Europe now. Um, and uh, we're uh, 22 people. Um, and uh, we still have an office here in Austin, um, and uh, even the people that, that work at that office work from home quite frequently. Um, and um, it's uh, uh, we're, we just finished a hiring um, set, um, but we're likely going to be starting up again very soon. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the primary way that, that Four Kitchens finds um, new hires? So we've always taken a, um, a, a sort of a two-pronged approach to it, um, and one of them is um, is always through the community and through referrals and through people that we uh, that, that we know and through we meet from going to all the different events that at least somebody from Four Kitchens is at um, across the country and across Europe now. Um, and uh, but then on the other hand, we've also um, uh, always uh, had a lot of um, success at hiring outside of the community um, and um, hiring people who are. Um, uh, who may not know Drupal, um, but know the web, or are strong programmers looking to uh, move into web development, even from a completely different um, uh, skill set, um, and that's that's worked out very well for us in in building diversity within our um, uh, within our company, um, and also in um, in allowing uh, uh, our um, uh, uh, finding people that are not necessarily. In the in the very competitive space of the you know Drupal hiring scene. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm sure Eric could talk about the very competitive space in, in the Drupal hiring scene as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, same questions. Sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, I'm Eric Affin. I work uh, in Acquia, and um, yeah, we have been expanding rapidly for quite some time now. I joined the company uh, a little over a year and two months ago. We were 220. And we're at 460 as of today. Um, so we've been growing pretty quickly. The 50 million of uh, additional financing will accelerate that a little mm -hmm. bit more. Yeah. Um, but uh, the company was originally founded in 2007. Um, Dries is one of the founders, along with Jay Batson. Um, and we uh, are in Burlington, Massachusetts, is where we're based, but we have offices in Portland, Oregon. Um, we have a small shared office in Washington, D.C., um, a small shared office in Paris, and a, a main European office of about 40 people in Reading, U.K. So I think we're in 20 countries right now, um, and kind of across uh, five continents. We're missing a couple, so we're looking to check those off in 2014. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, Antarctica might be a little tough, but, uh, <laughs> unless there's anybody know a penguin. <laughs> no. um, so uh, primarily, where we get, uh, where we find great talent um, to some of the panelists kind of already points that the, uh, the, the ecosystem, the Drupal ecosystem is um, not expanding as rapidly as 
our companies inside that ecosystem are growing and need Drupal talent. So um, we've been creative. We've done the traditional things. We go, we come to gr camps and cons, and we get we meet a lot of great people. Um, networking. Um, we have a, a very strong referral program internal to the company that we encourage people to to branch out. Um, but we've also had a lot of success in attracting people uh, that are just strong web developers and strong strong technologists and training them internally. Um, we had a program called Aquia U where we hired eight folks who had never touched Drupal before. We trained them up, gave them jobs, uh, and six of them are still with us a, a year and a half later. Uh, and, I, and four of them, I would probably say, are you know still rising stars in our organization, and they've brought a diversity of thought, um, different perspectives into the organization that are outside the normal Drupal kind of philosophy and, and backing. And it's it's been great. So we 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 are at this point, given w what we're trying to do, um, we have to continue to expand, looking at new talent pools. Um, but uh, obviously, we're still primarily looking for uh, for for Drupalists, and this is why we come to these. Uh, one of the reasons why we come to these events and um, and give back to the community so much. Okay. So um, thank you, Eric. Um, we're gonna, the floor is open for questions. I've got some questions. I'm going to feed them as we go, but if, by all means, if you have a question, you can step up to the mic. Um, the goal of this is kind of for um, our panelists to talk about what they look for and how you can position yourself um, and prepare yourself to you know, potentially get a, a full-time job, which could you know, obviously a, a career with um, a company you know, rep, like one of the four that are represented up here. Um, so if you have a question, by all means, uh, step up to the mic. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep on asking my questions, and then you have to listen to all my questions. Yes. I'm sorry. In, in your presentation, did, did did you cover kind of the same questions in your presentation? I, I think I covered quite a bit of, okay. of it. And, um, you know, how we go about hiring. Um, really, you know, like, like the other said here, but a you know, multi-pronged approach. Um, we also have a, a training program we put together uh, this last year, and we, we've hired um, about 10 people. We, we broke it into two subsets, one for front end, one for back end, and ran through um, a series of, you know, of uh, curriculums for the different disciplines. And um, we also have a very strong um, referral program um, and we focus quite a bit on, on, you know, social media and, you know, sort of that, you know, trees and branches and, <laughs> and uh -huh. leaves effect. I mean, that's how, that's the core of how we grew originally was the friend of the friend of the friend of the friend. And, you know, that, that's still the core, but, um, you know, you can only go get so far that way. So mm -hmm. we've, we've been focusing on, you know, as I said, building our own curriculum and um, bringing on great talent. And, and turning them into Drupalists. That's been our focus this last year. And I, I think we did a count that these five companies have a total of 100 and more than 150 current open positions for Drupal professionals, which is, you know, I don't think there's 150 people in this room. So, um, Eric, I wanted to ask you one question. You, you mentioned you're at 460 right yes. now. What percentage of those are, are Drupal? based or Drupal focused as opposed uh, to sales, marketing, support staff, things like that? Yeah, probably a little over half. Okay. Um, obviously, as we've, uh, as we've expanded out the organization, we've had to, we expand out all of the corporate functions. So mm -hmm. whether that's finance or marketing, sales, HR and recruiting and talent acquisition. Um, but uh, yeah, we still the primary focus when you come down to it, it you know, we're a technology company and digital business um, solutions. And right. so uh, it come, we probably, probably about 60% are, okay. uh, are, are technology focused. And then so, so Nancy, Kim, uh, Mike, and Steve, I'm going to guess that that percentage in, in your companies is higher, more percent of, of Drupal technologists, is that? Yeah, it's uh, probably two-thirds, two-thirds Drupal developers, okay. front end, including front-end developers. Sure. Right. They count as Drupal developers, right, Herschel? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, um, the, like, there has been a shift to uh, – you know, like I think it was mentioned before, the the, the JavaScript frameworks, the MVC frameworks. Um, so you can actually have 
people, and we actually are. We actually go to like the JavaScript meetups and try to f meet people who are specialists in that area because there, it is quite possible now to actually have someone who just focuses on that and doesn't actually know Drupal at all. Right. Yeah. Um, there might be an Angular JS expert, um, and all they need to know is okay, what's the the web service interface I need to talk to. So I think that's that's another thing to consider as well is that these roles are becoming more can become more specialized. Um, as we go forward. Let me ask, let me ask a, a different kind of question, and we'll go right down the line with like a quick answer. On a scale of one to ten, like how, I'm going to use the word dire, so where ten is like most dire, and one is, it's troublesome but not so bad yet. How, as far as your need of talent, how dire is the situation one to ten? I'll start off. Uh, about a seven, I'd say. Okay, Steve? Uh, I just need to caveat that by saying, actually, not that bad, because okay. um, we find that when you build a bit of a reputation in the community, and in Europe, there's quite a close-knit, uh, strong community, and we are you know, substantially bigger than a lot of the other the players in that market, and known for the culture and so on, uh, we get a lot of applications out of the blue, um, and, which is great. So we're in a reasonable position. Okay. So whichever way the scale was round. So that'd Not be bad. lower. That'd yeah, be, that'd be lower. That'd yeah. be lower, yes. I'm terrible Mike? with numbers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as I, as I mentioned, we we just finished a round of hiring, so mm -hmm. we're kind of like we're about to have it. Um, uh, okay. uh, if you had asked this question in January or actually at near the end of February, I, I would have said, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but um, but that's going to that, that, that's gonna change very rapidly this year. And, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be bringing in people. I think okay. you made a very good point in that, you know, we, you know, yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of connections out there. So. Okay, Eric. Yeah, we're we're, we're probably uh, six or seven. Um, okay. You know, there's obviously there there are some areas of the company that are we have more critical needs than others that uh, you know we're trying to ramp up either it's a new product or uh, or pushing out uh, kind of uh, new new ideas into the community. Um, but you know, overall, six or seven. Okay, and Nancy. I have a really hard time figuring that number. I, I would say because you used the Do word you lose sleep, sleep over it? <laughs> yes. Oh. But, yeah. but, but, <laughs> but that's because of the focus. So we, we set out this year to, to hire 70 people, and that's nowhere near you guys. But, uh, you know, also we don't have the funding. So <laughs> <laughs> that so, helps. Um, so it, it was, you know, our number one goal for the year. We, we started the year and looked at you know, what do we see the, the client demand? And, you know, we're about mid-year, and, and we've, we've got the 35. So we are month after month hitting our target. So I wouldn't use the word dire, but, well, yeah, do I lose sleep? Not because I'm worried, but because I'm focused. Okay. You know, so um, it, it's really a, a, a main thing that, you know, the, the executives, and, you know, and team members at Blink, you know, everybody's part of it. We need to do interviews. We need to do onboarding. You know, it's not just about hiring. It, it's about keeping people around, you know, mm -hmm. and making sure that they're happy. So, you know, everybody has to get involved with, with onboarding and mentoring and making sure those programs are, are robust and, and mature. You just don't, you know, want to bring people and go, oh, there's a computer. Have fun. Yeah, exactly. All right, go ahead. Question, sir? Uh, what are some potential red flags where if uh, people have all the skills and you kind of like them, but th there's this one thing you're like, you know, hell no. Like, what, what are some of those? Um, I think um, you've got to be careful about um, hiring, you know, so-called rock stars oh, because – Essentially, <laughs> but esse <laughs> well, I mean, you, you obviously want people to, to fit in with your culture, so you want them to gel with the team. Often if you've, if you've got people who are, you know, um, work by themselves most of the time, they might be really skilled, they might be really good at what they're doing, they're not necessarily good at communicating or being part of a team or collaborating and learning to work with other people. Um, so, I mean, the the kind of questions I would ask in interviewing them would be around how do they, how do they work in teams before, what kind of experience they have in working with teams, um, what challenges they have working in with, with teams, and, you know, I expect... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear real problems that they've faced, you know. I don't expect them to have a perfect 
record of everything went well and I solved all the problems. It's like, well, this is the challenge that I had and I, you know, it was really hard. And I think that's really important. I, I have a couple of red flags. Uh, one would be a new job every six months for the last you know, five to 10 years. Um, and another big red flag is it, when you start to talk to folks and um, ask them about their previous job and they start saying negative things about their, their previous bosses, their, their previous mm -hmm. team, yeah. that, that's really a red flag that they don't have that level of professionalism to, to, to filter it and you know, say something you know, relatively nice about the experience and, and why it may or may not have been a match for them, but, but um, in, in a positive way. I was gonna, I was gonna say so uh, kind of a, a one one flag is uh, on top of the ones that have already been mentioned um, a lack of knowledge uh, of of the company um, you know you, mm -hmm. you you don't have to have read all the white papers and read all the blogs and uh, and and know exactly what's going on read all the press releases but you should have a good understanding of what the company does how it fits into uh, into the world of technology and you know what the what the goals of the company are some 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 very basics on the company um, and you know we we ask for that in in the interview you know, ta tell me about what you know about Acquia tell me about how you have heard of it heard of us and uh, talk to me about you know why you're excited to work at a company like Acquia. Uh, and if they, if they struggle with those questions, then I question whether they're really going to be passionate about to join the company. Okay, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, and actually all these are really good red flags and all, <laughs> totally the, the things we look for. You know, pen and paper, you want to take some notes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, uh, so two things that, like, that, 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 that hasn't been mentioned yet is, um, is, is one is, is blaming um, you know, w when asking a question like what was a, you know, what was something that didn't go well um, is when they talk about the, the failures of other people. Um, and that can usually mean that that's usually going to be what the answer will always be, um, regardless. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is um, not being able to produce a code sample. Um, we work in open source. Um, even if you've been working on a top secret project, um, you are likely screwing around with an Arduino or something in your free time or writing your own, I don't know, cat blog. Um, and if you're not, and that's always just really weirdly suspicious. And every time I've taken a chance on that, I've been really, I've lost an hour of my life. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was a really good point, actually, because, um, one, and this came up, I think James mentioned it before, but when you're recruiting, you really, you know, you go and Google that person. You'll mm -hmm. go and look at GitHub. Uh, yeah. You'll look at their Drupal.org profile. you would be looking for examples of their work. Um, and that's the best judge of, whether they're the right, not necessarily um, just their skills and they've got the right skills, but how well they engage in the communities, how mm -hmm. will they engage in open source? Are they are they nerd enough? Are they well, <laughs> well? Are they motivated enough to go yeah. and spend time working on a, a project that they're passionate about? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not just you don't want someone who's just going to turn up and just be oh, well, this is my day job mm -hmm. and I'll just clock on and clock off. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be passionate about it. Okay. If I can just add, oh, yeah, before, we, before we wrap up, if I can just add a few oh, we're minutes. We're not wrapping up. Uh, well, wrap up this question. Oh, um, you yeah, to cut me um, off so I can't ask my question. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd just like to add, kind of on top of that, really, a, a key red flag. Uh, one of the main reasons that I find uh, I reject um, potential candidates um, is often uh, down to communication skills. Uh, and that's what we're looking for all of the time, really strong communication skills. And communication isn't just transmission, it's about you know, input as well and listening. Um, so some of the things for that will be looking at perhaps the way people engage in the issue queues. Um, and you, know, you look at people's D.O. profile, but you go beyond that and look at some recent issues they've been involved in. Um, how are they you know, reporting bugs? How are they responding to bugs filed on projects of theirs? Um, you know, does it involve swear words and ranting, or, <laughs> or are they quite you know helpful and polite, um, and uh, you know things like that? Um, but also in the way that when we meet them, how do they communicate with us? Then uh, are they sort of uh, really 
uh, you know, l interested and curious about the work that we're doing mm -hmm. uh, and able to ask intelligent questions and kind of get to the point and understand that? And are they also able to convey the important information about themselves and projects that they've worked on? And this isn't about being a slick, wow communicator. It's, you know, some people can be quite quiet and still be a great communicator. So um, it's about the information that's conveyed and the, the connection between the, you know, the two people in the, the communication. So there's the listening, there's the transmission. Um, both of those are important. So that's a key thing. And I think it's one of the weaker spots within this industry. There's a real focus just on the pure technical skills and not really on the interpersonal skills that are the layer on top of that. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a human API. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting that very little of what the five of you said had to do with, with you know, book knowledge or technical knowledge. It seems like that's like the initial gate that gets you there. Mm -hmm. and then the actual decision depends a lot on, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, more on the cultural fit. Your resume, yeah. uh, your resume gets you a phone call, gets you in the door. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, it's about communication. It's about attributes. It's about behavioral characteristics, culture, fit, passion, mm -hmm. integrity. You should have saved Absolutely. that for the end. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, one last one that I'll add to that. No, and Barry, was, he's only going to wait sorry, so long. Yeah. Yeah. No, all right. All right, so no cover letter. <laughs> um, the amount of time people that just sub submit their resume without um, a, a cover letter is, you know, is somewhat daunting. And then when we ask people to submit a co cover letter and let them know the reasons why we're asking for it, which are, you know, not just because we're asking them to just follow directions, mm -hmm. uh, it's because we want to understand how they communicate um, uh, in, 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 in written form and also how they speak about themselves and what they under and what they were able to glean from our website about our company. Okay. And yeah, I just want to back him up there because that's a damn good point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's the. Come on, Harry, come on. But uh, yeah, we pay scant attention to the resume or CV, as we call it in the yeah. old world, um, and uh, uh, we pay so much attention to the email. I mean, an email, even out of the blue, uh, that's well written, that is personal. Uh, it says so much. You know, it's well laid out, it's well written, um, and that will get you a, a call or meeting up in a cafe or meeting up in the pub. That's a very common way that we recruit. Um, let's start by meet for a pint, see how we get on, see if there's communication, then we'll arrange something more formal or to meet some of our colleagues and so on uh, for a peer review. Um, but, yeah, that first cover email matters way more than the resume. Absolutely. Should we stop messing with Barry at this point? <laughs> 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 All right, Barry, you're up. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, get it. All right, well, you let, need let, to let, speak into the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, we're going to let Barry go. Let, let, let's, let's let Barry go first. Yeah, let's let Barry go first. Yeah, we'll, we'll first I, I think we need sure? a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to feel well, guilty. I, I just want to point out that the radio guy was the one who emphasized communications. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the question I have is, what's your attrition rate? Everybody's talked about how many people they're hiring, uh, how you know the people that get come in have to stick around and all that, but what are your respective attrition rates? And, and now I don't know why you didn't want me to start answer. on this end and work this way. So, Nancy? Um, actually, we haven't measured it. I mean, it, it's been um, traditionally something that's been extremely rare. Um, I can think of a couple people who have left Blanco over the history that we might not have wanted to. Um, just about everybody else uh, who, who left on their way out sort of planned. We talked earlier, and I think you mentioned that the first five people that you've that you hired are still with Blank. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and you know, grew in, in in their skills, you know, all the way up to you know with us. Right. So you know, it, it's a it's a great feel, but um, you know, but that's one of the things that sort of keeps me up at night, to be honest with you. It is how do how do we keep doing that? You know, having a very low attrition <laughs> rate, and yeah. and I know that it's not something as we continue to progress. Um, that's a reality that nobody ever leaves, right? right. Um, so um, it, it's something that you know we you know we talk about quarterly about you know what's the culture, how do we hire, what are you know the best things you know to keep the attrition rate low. But I, I think the key key to that is um, not hiring the wrong people. As I said, you know the folks who have left, 
really weren't the best matches. Maybe, you know, that day we said, mm, yeah, let's lower the bar a little, or, you know, we really need people, so, so let's take them on. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think we have a good idea of who's the right fit. But, you know, sometimes you want to get that project done. Um, so it's, right. everything's a balance. Um, so we're, we're probably, uh, historically we've been single digits, um, but you know, as, as we have scaled up and we've grown, I mean, we're, we're experiencing some of the growing pains of going from a company that a couple years ago was 150, 100, 150, and now we're at 460 and expanding rapidly. Um, so the same people who helped the company get from point A to point B might not be the same people that want to be part of a company to go from point B to point Z, which is where we're headed. Um, so there's a, there's a realization that the same person that joins the company as employee number 40 might not, you know, the chances of them leaving, if they leave, they're probably going to a company where they're going to be employee number 30 or 40 again. And, they're, and, and they, they understand that our culture maybe changes and evolves over time. Um, so, you know, you grow and you, you want to retain as much of your original culture as possible, but it's inevitable that you're going to change a little bit. Um, we are happy where, we're, where we've been. Um, you know, we've been really excited with the people that we've brought in. And sometimes they have, I mean, it's, sometimes it's a compliment. They, ex they expand their knowledge so quickly and so well, and they make such a meaningful impact, it gets noticed and they get recruited and they have opportunities to do similar things or uh, maybe a larger role that we haven't gotten there yet. We, have, we can't, you know, not everybody can be a director and not everybody can be a VP of product and a VP of engineering. So uh, if somebody gets those opportunities, sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to say, no, we, you know, uh, we don't understand why you're leaving. We kind of do understand why you're leaving and it's a great opportunity, but stay in touch and hopefully you'll be back. Yeah, uh, same here. It's it's always been very it's always been very traditionally very low, um, and everything that you know uh, that these two have t talked about as the reasons why people leave are have always been true. It's either that it really wasn't a fit, and sometimes it takes a it, one of the things that we um, ha that changed is that we very are, have become very quick at identifying a fit um, after and uh, sort of a very um, targeted uh, approach to. Um, sort of the what happens after you get hired um, and how we, you know, what the evaluation is and the, that evalu evaluation happens both ways. And there's like meetings that we have set up that we sort of now, so that we understand, uh, well, is this what you expected? <laughs> um, and then we tell you, well, this is what we expected and yeah, here's where, you know, here's where, here, here's, where um, uh, here's where you're excelling and here's where you can do some improvement. Um, but, um, and some, and then also people leaving for the, some of the same reasons is that, you know, the, um, uh, uh, starting a very successful um, hosting company. <laughs> um, it's again, it's not something that we measure, um, which is a bad thing. We should measure more. We're a very management like company. We kind of rely on self managing teams. Um, and we like to be kind of very light in terms of the, the top level management. So we don't really have an HR function as such. Um, and therefore, we aren't kind of measuring all these fantastic dashboard statistics and so on. Perhaps we should. Um, but perhaps I think that also means that it's not too big a problem on our radar at the moment. If it was, it would get more attention from the small management team we have. Um, when we made the transition, we did the merger between the four agencies from across Europe. Uh, there was some change around then because suddenly they went from being, each of the four companies went around from being, you know, 30 person company, something like that or more, uh, to suddenly being part of a 140 person company. And again, uh, as Eric's saying, it, that's quite a change. And it also meant that we were attracting a different kind of client, a much more large-scale enterprise client that needed more serious engineering talent and therefore there wasn't really much position for the kind of site builder type people. So there was a bit of a change round from, from our point of view and from some of the individual's point of view about what was the right fit. So there we saw some change around the merger but then things have been very stable since then. Yeah, and I'll probably just make the point that um, you know, hiring the wrong person is a very expensive thing um, you don't want to. You don't want to make a mistake. So, while you can put as much effort, you know, you pu you want to put as much effort in up front, just going through that evaluation, making sure it's a good fit, um, before you actually go down the path of recruiting someone. 
Um, and then you want to do continual review. So you want to make sure that you're meeting with them, having those conversations about how things are going. Try to address issues before it gets to the point where someone's like had enough and walked out. Usually it's, it's because they, they haven't raised an issue. They've been bottling something in and it hasn't had time to come out and they've just got to the point where they feel like they've got no out. Um, so they leave. Um, but, you know, you've got to be honest. Sometimes there's people that come in and they don't have... That, you know, they, they obviously get through that process and they don't have um, the same cultural fit or you, and you've just got to be honest about it and there's a, it's almost like a relationship, you know. It's, um, we agree to disagree and let's go our separate ways and it's not necessarily, you know, a, an ugly um, separation. It can be quite amicable and you know, often we've let people go who we've gone on and, and given them, you know, um, ref being referees for them in their jobs and, and, and help them find the next position. Um, because we understand, like, you know, they're looking for something else. I want to touch real quick on something Steve said. Um, you talked about site builders. I'm going to define a, st a site builder as someone who doesn't necessarily know code, but just knows Drupal and configuration and modules and things really well. Are there, are, are there roles for just pure site builders in Drupal shops these days, or is everybody looking for someone who knows a bit of code or DevOps or front end or... In my, from my perspective, there's people who are front-end focused but no site building or developer focused and no site building. So it's one of those things that you don't target a specific role for. You know, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's something that everyone is involved in. Um, there's just a spectrum, I guess, of, okay, well, you, you know all this stuff and, and we've got front-end developers who are writing, you know, PHP code, back-end PHP code as well. It might not be their specialty, but they're, they're focused on, on the front-end. So... Yeah. That, that role specifically doesn't, doesn't really exist. We, we refer to it as a role on a project, so you'll be doing site building and development right. or you'll be doing front end development, but not necessarily a, an individual. I guess I'm trying to it. figure out is if someone just knows site building, is that enough? I, I'm, you know what, I, I think it is, but I think it's not for our firm. Right? Okay. So if, if you look at... Um, it's a stepping stone to... I, I think if, if you look at a, a firm that's doing small business websites, um, there's absolutely tons of work and opportunity and mm -hmm. need out there. But okay. it's just not for, for the folks that are mm -hmm. on this panel. So are you saying agree with that? Everybody? Yeah, I was just going to add, there's a lot of small agencies out there who really value that kind of mix of site-building skills. And what you can build in Drupal these days without writing a line of code is amazing. It's mm -hmm. very powerful, and for small business clients, uh, it, can, it can be everything that they need. You don't need to code at all. It's configuration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Did you have something to add, or...? No, that's just, okay. that's exactly everything that's been yes. said. <laughs> I'll just add one more thing to delay Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you ask this question? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. So um, there's obviously a lot of focus on hiring uh, developers and technical people. Um, I just was kind of curious um, on your take on how you guys um, bring in people on that are not technical. So particularly like sales guys, project managers, um, particularly for people who may not have ever heard Drupal and Obviously, it's not. There's a nuance to, to doing Drupal projects um, and Drupal sales that's not the same. So, here I'll I'll start off. Um, I mean, we how we find those people are your more tra your traditional methods. I mean, you're probably not going to find your traditional regional sales manager here at DrupalCon, although I did speak to one great guy earlier, so I'm really <laughs> excited about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean. We look for the, the baseline of what we look for kind of crosses all the departments. Um, we're looking for passion. We're looking for integrity, intelligence. Um, what was the other one? Initiative. That's the P triple I that our CEO oftentimes talks about. P triple I, um, and we look for cultural fit. So those things have nothing to do with technical skills. They don't have to do with your quotas that you hit as a sales guy or the products that, you know, the marketing campaign that you were running and analytics that you were looking to see how many click-throughs you had. Um, you know, those are, the, those are the, the technical skills in a specific job um, that are important that they kind of hit a certain benchmark. But um, we, we hire across the departments with a, a set of kind of core values that we're looking for um, to join Acquia. You know, are you passionate about us? I mean, we have our, I, I, I've been part of large organizations like Liberty Mutual, um, 
Mellon Financial, which is now um, Bank of New York. And I've never come across a finance group that is as chatty, open, crazy, and fun as the group that we have at Acquia. And I like to think that it's because we hire those types of people. We hire for that cultural fit. And I've never seen that at any of my other companies. And they're chatty and crazy in finance. And that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Like, usually they're heads down. They're doing their accounting. They're, doing the, they're helping you do your expense reports and billing analysts and accounts receivable. And they rarely socialize with the, with, with the, with the rest of the group. At my company, they're the first ones to the keg at 5 o'clock. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. Do you have lawyers like that? Yeah. We do. Yeah, we actually, have, we do. Uh, we have a great lawyer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's, it's great. It's, it, for me, it makes me feel good when uh, I can hire somebody as an accountant or as a contracts counsel mm -hmm. or somebody in sales or marketing that even though they're not directly working with the technology that our company is centered around, but they evangelize it and they're excited about the company because of what we do. Yeah, I'll second the the passion. So, um, I mean, I think all all the P triple I's that P has written down that I've already forgotten um, are all really important and they're actually a great way of sort of describing kind of like what makes somebody successful in anything that they do. Um, and the developer, finance guy, um, you know, uh, a salesperson. Um, but it's um, it's a passion um, for what what we're looking for. Um, our um, uh, one of our uh, one of our longer hiring periods or uh, positions that we had trouble filling was our office manager because the office manager that we had before was so freaking awesome and fun um, that we were looking for somebody to fill those shoes and the things that we were asking for of our office manager was somebody that was um, that had um, uh, a lot of crafts because <laughs> we were tired of not being able to do crafts in the office and our old office manager did crafts and they were awesome. um, so like that's the, that's the kind of stuff that you know and, and those kinds of those kinds of qualities also fall um, also um, cycle into our developers and into our uh, project managers is that we look for people who are really passionate about both what uh, about um, about life in general and about what they do um, and about what role they're filling um, and um, and usually, oddly enough, those things go together. So if people are really into the yo-yo and get really, really expert at it, um, there's a likelihood that, that they've become really, really expert at project management as well. So. I have another little aspect to add mm -hmm. to it, some, a part of the question that you asked. So uh, project <coughs> managers, creative folks, um, people who are working with a, a little less than the office managers or the, the financials. Um, w we put them through um, our training for that we offer to to clients. We put them through Drupal in a day. We put them through sites. We put them through you know a few days worth of you know what is Drupal, and you know we have a, a semi customized you know link only version of what we offer to clients uh, because we really feel that anybody who's going to work as part of the delivery team. Um, knows the, the core essences of Drupal. Okay. That was actually my clarification. I was more interested in that aspect of whether you guys do any training of your salespeople or, you know, if, you know, selling open source, for example, just even not necessarily knowing that much about Drupal is, is just different. And so that's what I was kind of curious a bit more about was, was those aspects, if you can comment on those. My, my short answer would be yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, could, I can add to that as well. I mean, we're, we're a much smaller shop, but... Um, we don't necessarily have the role of, of sales because I think um, I think often clients can kind of smell a sales pitch and especially if somebody is selling something they don't know anything about. So um, we definitely try to position ourselves as consultants to them. So anyone who is a project manager or uh, anyone who's going to meet with the client to, to talk about what their project is has to come to that discussion with the knowledge to be able to share and have and be able to give like a frank assessment of of what they're asking for and be able to advise them um yeah okay. so we do the same we do training for for our stuff 
if I can add to that, just to delay this question again. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a trend. Um, yeah, Steve, I want to when you interview people, do they, are they allowed to speak? <laughs> <laughs> it's just I always come last. I, think oh, okay. the, I let everyone else have their turn, okay, and then right. I, I just jump in okay. at the end. Um, I'll jump in first next time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, a little bit about that, that kind of consultancy approach, because we have the, the culture very much that we don't really have salespeople so much because our kind of drive to have healthy web projects, we always saw that barrier where sales went out and sold something, drove away in their Porsche and threw it over the fence to the dev team going, yeah, deal with that. And the dev team going, go, you, you said we'd do what? <laughs> By when? For how much? <laughs> um, and we want to get rid of that. So we've uh, kind of, we don't really have sales team, we have consultancy team, and they're with the project throughout its lifetime. Um, and therefore, they do need quite a broad knowledge. Our CEO, Vesa, talks about uh, us needing T-shaped people. Uh, and this speaks a little bit to what you said as well. And that is that they have a very broad knowledge of stuff, and that's the kind of the upper bar of the T. Uh, and that could include crafts and things like that, <laughs> maybe craft beer. Um, and uh, it, you know, so there's a very broad knowledge. They're interested in a whole range of things to a certain depth. But then there's one thing that they are really laser focused on and they have a real depth on. Um, and that could be a range of things. So that could be UX consultancy. It could be uh, a sector. They could be really specialist in government or they could be really specialist in media um, and those kind of areas. So we look for that T-shape when we're recruiting. But then what we can do is we can broaden out the knowledge of the kind of top bar of the T. So they never need to become Drupal experts you know, to get really deep but they need enough knowledge about Drupal and how it can be applied and the way that we run projects and so on. But we, yeah, we look for that T from the very start. But it seems like in every single case here, you're, you're not, when you're hiring for those types of non-technical positions, you're not looking for that Drupal knowledge coming in or that technical knowledge coming in, but that's something it sounds like you all do in-house. Is that fair? Ab okay. Absolutely. I mean, okay. our, yeah, our... Uh, our office manager made her first gig commit right before uh, our, uh, yeah. So. Fantastic. All right. Is it John? Is it John? John. Okay. I was going to ask you to explain more on your coding sample that you never saw before you hired them, and it turned out to be a bad hire because that was the red flag and people didn't pass the smell test. Um, yeah, so it was, it was more the absence of a coding sample. Um, there's a pure absence. It wasn't necessarily. Yeah, it was, you know, some people that, um, a, lot of, a lot of people who will be, will feel, nervous about giving a code sample mm -hmm. um, and don't know really what to really pull out or, or, or they feel that they are, uh, the work that they've been doing has been um, under NDA. Mm -hmm. A lot of times those, those are barriers that can be, you know, um, uh, crossed by, um, uh, you know, obfuscating the code or, you know, pulling right. into the, you know, stuff you've been doing as a hobby or that you've contributed back and things like that. So kind of back to what you were talking about as far as like a T-shape. What other additional skills do you look for when you're hiring site builders and developers and UX front end guys? Here, you want to start this one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, actually, it, there's not really the specifics. It's the, the idea that there's breadth. So, for example, in the industry that we're in, there is such an incredible range of stuff going on and such an incredible rate of change that it, it's impossible to know everything about everything. But what we look for is an element of interest in a whole wide range of things. So you don't want a back-end developer who cares nothing about any kind of UX or front-end stuff at all. And you don't want a, a UX guy who cares nothing about code or you know that kind of you want some level of interest across the board um, and also some level of interest just in life and people and crafts and flowers and uh, <laughs> whatever else it is um, so yeah that's the kind of the broad bit of the tea and then the narrow bit can kind of be in anything first of all it can just be simply showing that they have the ability to specialize and get really deep into a subject that may not be the the depth of the tea that is right for us maybe we want to move that a little but uh, it's that ability to specialize and to become an expert in something. So our kind of core values, as it, uh, if you like, uh, although we try not to call them that because it sounds very corporate, but um, <laughs> it's kind of professional, expert, open, and collaborative, uh, and we look for those things. So the expert bit is important, that deep bit. 
um, the professional is being able to talk and communicate uh, uh, about a wider range of things across the top of the tea. And then the collaborative and open bit is really important as well. So we're looking for elements in the top bar of the tea that's showing their collaboration. So maybe there's you know, community things that they're involved in. Maybe there's all sorts. Um, just things that demonstrate that open and collaborative nature. You, yeah, that, that was what you just stole my words. I was about to say <laughs> a demonstrated ability to do those things. So um, especially if you're hiring a junior, I mean, they don't have a lot of depth of experience, but if they can demonstrate they have a, an ability to learn things, they've gone and tried something, it doesn't matter if they were good at it or they necessarily you know, achieved brilliance in that area, it's that they've demonstrated that they've got a, a, uh, an ability to, to learn new things, um, have a passion about it, um, because that's going to bode well for them when they s start to learn you know, a new technology. They, you know that they're going to have a much better chance of, of getting up to speed quickly um, and, and, and excelling at things. And another thing I was just going to add was that um, you know, if you're interviewing someone who's worked, has experience in, in industries or in the industry or worked on other projects, I always ask them what was it that you, um, what was the project about? What were you, what were you you know, what were you doing on that project? And you can really differentiate people um, by their, the kind of, the, the, the scope of what their thoughts are. If you've got someone who says, oh, on that project I, um, you know, I had to, you know, fix bugs and I had to, um, you know, we were trying to build this thing and this technology and it was really difficult and, you know, we got there in the end. Um, you can see that their focus is very narrow. They're focusing on the specific technical challenges of that job. Um, but you might have another candidate who's like, okay, well, this, this client was really trying to move into this market. They saw an opportunity to, uh, you know, to, that, that, that was there. The challenges for them were their competitors were trying to do this. They're looking at um, the project from a different level, and they're really good candidates to grow within an org organisation because they're already able to think at the level and understand what the client's challenges are. They're not just trying to understand the technical challenges. They're looking at the bigger picture. So. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good point, and and that, that's something that you know that that's kind of core in, in what we look for um, always is 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 an ability to sort of like look at things from um, from outside of whatever whatever perspective that they're coming from. Um, so if it's somebody who's you know who's UX, be, um, it's being able to understand that there's a website at the end of whatever the artifacts that they're creating, um, or if it's a developer, understanding that there's um, a design aspect that's going to make that successful, or that there's business needs that are that, that whatever they're doing is is fulfilling, um, and um, that that is um, th that is one of the things that definitely differentiates people who are successful, and um, um, and who wouldn't be because it's um, we're a consultancy we um, uh, we come in and, and solve problems for people whether that's building them a new website or fixing a you know a, a, a broken website or or adding features to an existing one, it's fixing some sort of problem. And if you understand what those problems are, um, you can get to those solutions. And it also leads to um, that those those people are the bo are, are the ones who are the most collaborative because they are compassionate about the other parts of the project. And that's that's really important. And that's something that that is um, that compassion and willingness to work together um, is. Uh, is what you know um, is one of the differentiators in some in because we work in very um, very blended and very very tight knit teams. So. I'll just add one quick thing here. Um, so one of one of our favorite questions to ask, and I actually got this from a from an engineering manager years ago, um, back when I was recruiting like mainframe folks. <laughs> <laughs> date myself a little bit, um, but uh, he he would ask. When you're done with your day job and you go home, tell me what you're working on. What's your passion project? And what he wanted to hear was, you know what? I spend all day working on this technology at home. You know what I'm doing? I'm coding in this new language. I'm trying this new thing. Or I'm trying to create a, a new game that I can play with some of my friends online. Like, we want to see that demonstrated passion um, and it, it, it's always been one of my favorite questions is, you know, and, and if they give me a good answer, I'm like, we have, we have a good one yeah. here. Just to take it back to, like, the original question about code samples, 
the um, the code samples that I submitted to uh, to Four Kitchens when I got my job was um, some uh, some uh, uh, Apache Solar uh, like object oriented code for the Apache Solar module like wasn't no Drupal in it really um, and um, an Arduino sketch so um, <laughs> yeah it's not uh, it's not about um, what we're looking for and I think I mean um, I'm just gonna conversation you know it's it's not um, it's not specific knowledge it's depth of knowledge and um, uh, and an approach uh, I just want to back that up with a story last week before DrupalCon I was traveling around Texas <laughs> in a car nice four by four exploring the far west of Texas and ended up in some really remote places and uh, in one of these places one of the, uh, the waitresses was saying uh, where are y'all from and that's the last I'll try the accent on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and I said, I'm from England. And she, she said, oh, I thought you were from Australia. And, uh, uh, and I, I said, well, you know, I'm from England. And she said, uh, well, how are you liking Texas? And I said, it's great. She says, yeah, I've never been anywhere else. Texas is the best place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and th there's a bit of a danger of that with Drupal, um, that we say, you know, Drupal is the best thing in the world. Well, what else do you use? Nothing, you know. Um, so, yeah, that experimentation, that trying out other things, it's what keeps us sharp. Uh, it's what, you know, makes us better at doing Drupal and brings better ideas to Drupal. So do experiment, do look around, do try other things. It's interesting. You went first, and you still <laughs> What can I say? I'm the shy Englishman. <laughs> You've all discussed um, recruiting uh, non-Drupal people into Drupal. So how are you guys going about that more? Um, I'm personally a .NET developer, but I do Drupal on the side kind of as project things. So what are you looking for in non-Drupal folk who are very technical but not specialized in Drupal yet? I'm happy to go first. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it, this is a really simple question. Um, you know, like what we hired for our Aqua U program and what we will continue when we have our next Aqua U class, which is coming up in a couple months, um, is passion and the 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 web technology experience. Like, if you have become, you know, I think the panel has talked about this. If you've become a little bit of an expert in something you are likely to have the capability to become an expert in something else. So if you, have, if you have been able to achieve great things and have some great professional achievements and you have some great code samples uh, and you have great projects that you can share with us about your .NET experience, then and you're dabbling with Drupal and you're getting passionate about it, great. Our guess is that you will probably then become a passionate, great Drupalist. Um, yeah, uh, I'll second that. Um, the the um, and the other thing is that the soft qualities that we've sort of talked about um, are also very important, um, and the non-technical qualities. Um, the the other thing um, is a um, I don't know how else to describe it besides sort of like sort of what's my favorite interview question, um, and that is um, after you press enter in the um, in the browser bar, what happens. Um, between then and when you get a web page, um, and um, in in the way I, that I look at it, um, everybody from a front end developer um, to a um, to a systems person um, should have a good answer, and that good answer might have the word magic happens <laughs> um, <laughs> in it somewhere. But in other parts of that answer, they're going to have really really in depth understanding, um, and so that's. Um, but they're going to also have a, a broad understanding of kind of what's going on in general. Um, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not specific to a framework, and it's not specific to a, you know, a programming language. It's understanding kind of like what's, what's, what are the underpinnings that are, um, uh, and the concepts that are making the web work um, that's going to make somebody successful at making the next framework, making the next you know, uh, you know, awesome Drupal module, things like that. And I, and I think, you know, a lot of your skills are transferable as well. I mean, you might be going into a team of people who only know Drupal, and you've got all this experience in another framework. You'll be able to compare and contrast the differences and go, well, you know, there's other ways of doing this, or I know some design patterns that we've been using in .NET that are going to apply. I mean, I did eight years of Java development before I started working with Drupal, and the first thing I did was look at, look at the Drupal code and go, oh. <laughs> it was all, and unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, 
Drupal 8 looks a lot like Java, so <laughs> <laughs> it's actually easier for me now looking at, at Drupal 8 code to go, all oh, right, well, you know, this is dependency <coughs> injection and that kind of stuff, right? So, um, you know, those skills are transferable. So, and I think the other thing would just be your openness to other technologies. I mean, um, the fact that you're here and you're, and you're asking about, uh, if you've got .NET experience and you're asking about Drupal, that means that you're interested in other things. I think that's important. Often people will be like, oh, this is what I do, and I don't I only do that, and uh, you know, I'm not interested in if you talk about that, I'm not touching that. I think if you're open to um, learning about all different kinds of technologies, then that obviously puts you in a better position. A follow-up? Oh, okay. Uh, I've actually just got more of a statement because the code samples has come up a uh, number of times and I just since we've got other like junior and other people in the room I just want to say you really shouldn't be afraid to post your code online even if it looks really bad um, because you can always get better from that and um, just as somebody else that's that's really important. Do, uh, do Drupal yeah. patches? Do patches in the issue queue count as code samples? Uh, I, I was just leaving. Yeah. If I <laughs> yeah, could no, say, no, like... I, I was waiting for <laughs> that song. Yeah, even, like, I mean, I, I think that's a really good statement, and it's really, um, uh, that's, that's a really good thing to keep in mind. And if you do, if you really want to learn, um, uh, like, how to, how to write better code, try to submit a patch to fix a module or find an issue. And you will learn faster than you ever did in school, um, and you will get more support and... and um, than, than you ever expected, um, much more so than even just sort of posting your, you know, sort of personal projects somewhere on, on, on GitHub. Not that that isn't important, that's awesome, and that's, that's also great. Um, but submitting patches and, and getting involved in the community and going to the code sprints here, um, uh, it's, it's, it is a fast way to learn, um, and, it's, um, and it's something that I spent years before I really realized how powerful it could be. So all things being equal, is it fair to say patches are more... Uh, valuable than code on GitHub? That's a tough one. Yeah. It depends on what the patches are. So, like, okay. it's like two different things. That core you patches. For. How about that? We'll start with the core patches. How about, th uh, so two different things? Like, because okay. you, like, um, it, one of the things that you want to find in a. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> is, is you want to find, you know, in a, in, in, you, you want to, in a code sample, you want to look at architecture and you want to look at, um, approach to problem solving. In okay. a patch, you may not have those yeah. things necessarily. You're looking at a sliver in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say that, you know, um, a lot of little sliver patches, or if, I mean, if you wrote, if you rewrote one of the subsystems, that's a really good code sample. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, it's a you know. 300K patch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So it's two different, it's two different things, but um, I don't, you know, if you have, if you have a thousand patches in there that are all little slivers, but you don't have some really great big code sample that like shows great sense of architecture, um, that's going to weigh really heavily as well. So okay. you know, it's it's all a balance. Yeah, and it's definitely learning how to to contribute in in, in any open source project is the the process of peer review. You know, everybody gets their code reviewed, even the smartest people, the people who are the maintainers of all the core subsystems. They all have have their code reviewed by anyone who's coming along to look at it. So you have to. Part, you know, if you want to participate, you just accept that that's that's what that's a part of it, and you'll benefit from it. Yeah, I guess it really is kind of a different thing. Yeah, a patch mm -hmm. because a patch is more than just the code; it's about participating in the process as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay. Um, thank you, everybody who's who's come and give your answers. I've I've thoroughly loved this. This has been this has been really really great. Um, uh, for me, from from what I've been gathering from this. Uh, I picked up basically two main things. Uh, one is that you guys very much focus more on the character ethic of the individual, the type of personality they are, the self-learners, the self-teachers, that type of stuff, and then those that also contribute to the community. Is that, that's, that's basically the synopsis of what I've gathered from you. Is there anything else that any of you would like to add? Just I know we're really short on time, but uh, I'd like to hear if there's anything outside of that that uh, that you guys would like to share with us, or is there anything is there anything else that weighs as much as either of those two things? Is that a fair? I think we brought up communication. Yeah. But that's part of that's part of the part of the, the person, the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one thing that we that we kind of talked about before that we that hasn't come out in the panel um, is that to to know yourself and to try to understand the company that you're going to be working with. 
Um, and it's really, really, and I think that's, that's really important is that um, the, the next hire for Wonder Crowd and the next hire for Four Kitchens prop, you know, may not be the same person. Um, and that's that because would be freaky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. one, two, um, yeah. <laughs> but there's different things. There's a you know each you know uh, culture and kind of like and fit um, is is highly personal and really kind of um, and and both and temporal in a lot of ways. Um, so knowing what you want out of a company and knowing what you um, where uh, what you provide to that company um, is, and what you want from that company. Is going to make that 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 hire hiring successful. So. God, these guys all agree they'll stay. As yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, my name my name is Israel Morales. So, I just want to ask you if you are currently uh, working with people from Latin America or you are planning to do it in the future. Yeah. So, uh, from DrupalCon Prague, I hired a support engineer who lives in Rio. Uh, and we're currently hiring um, some folks down in uh, down in Brazil and uh, potentially a couple other countries. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Our, uh, since we became a distributed company, and now that we've kind of we have somebody in, in Germany, it's you know we're um, all of our uh, all of our job searches are, are worldwide really. So there's no you know we're not we, we don't we're not hiring for Austin. We're not hiring for Latin America. We're hiring for good developers. Okay. At the moment, we've been very cautious on time zones because of the, the need for such deep communication in distributed teams. So at the moment, we don't really have anyone that's further than three hours plus or minus away. So from Europe, it would be pretty tricky for us at the moment. We're about to begin our first experiment with a larger time zone. Um, so we'll see how that goes, and then we may begin expanding out from there. Yeah, I mean, we're in the same position. So we pretty much try to hire people within a two or three hour time zone difference just because I mean we run agile processes as meetings every day people are chatting all day on IRC and it's um, having somebody who's working who's not around during the times that everyone else is it just makes it really difficult yes uh, um, I work in a startup that is based in Mountain View it's called Uyala and this startup has a big office in, in GDL I'm from GDL Guadalajara in Mexico so they're, they're, they have like uh, 50 engineers there, like a really good level. Just is for you to know that maybe it's, a, <laughs> maybe it's a good experiment you can do because as in the United States, you have the same like uh, time, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's another idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to make this the last question. So two of you already mentioned favorite interview questions. What other favorite interview questions you do took, you have? You took the last question. Yeah. That was mine, too. Very good. Thank you. So I think, I think we've, we've had Eric and Mike's already. So we'll, can we start down here with yeah. Nancy? Favorite interview well, question? Do you have one? I, I really, for me, and, and we've talked about this a lot, but I, I really like to understand about what someone's passionate about and, um, and look for that, that fire. Sometimes, you know, it could be about Drupal. Sometimes it could, it could be about a hobby. But if if they don't have something that they're, not, they're passionate about, that, you know. They're probably not going to be passionate about their job. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Steve? Actually, oh, no, Steve. This is your only chance to answer. You can't <laughs> answer again if you can. Actually, did you notice I skipped out two questions? I, I just oh, zipped you. up and that was it. Um, so uh, we're actually really informal with interviews, so there isn't kind of a set template. It goes very much for uh, what the role is and reacting to the individual and where the conversation goes. It's very much a conversation. So I can't say that there is a particular question, but what we're looking to explore, yeah, very much are those areas of passion, uh, the kind of the experience, things that are demonstrating those qualities I said of professionalism, expertise, openness, and collaboration. We're looking for things to reinforce all of those. So it's it's a conversation rather than any set questions. Yeah, we're we're pretty informal as well. But I would like to add that we we I like to ask people what mistakes they've made or what challenges they've had and you know what they had to do to get out of a particular situation because if you have someone who says look I've never had a problem I've never had any issues and all the stuff I've worked on has been is worked perfectly mm -hmm. it shows that they don't really un either 
understand <laughs> that they were had, having problems, <laughs> or they're not they're not very open and able to communicate the flaws that they've had or mistakes like that they've had, yeah. and uh, and understand um, what it was that got them out of that situation. So they're not very self reflective, and I think at least for our culture, we're very open, very honest about things, and and that's an important important question that I like to ask. Okay, very good. Um, so I think the five of you are, will, can stick around for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk to you one-on-one -on -one or exchange business cards. I think there are a bunch of your business cards on the back table, as well as there is a little blue bucket back there. If you're interested in any of our career training, you can throw your card in there, um, and we can get in touch with you. Um, and I think, do all of you, not all of you have booths? Do all of mm -hmm. I don't have a booth, no. Okay. <laughs> Aquia might have a booth, I'm not sure. <laughs> we have a big but, booth. Please um, come back. Yes, by all means. We have a ping pong table. Okay, a booth or a ping pong <laughs> table. Um, okay. If you want to talk to, to someone and just you know, have an informal conversation to get things rolling, and they're, obviously they're all going to be happy to talk to you because they all need people. And I might just do a plug. Actually, you can, everybody <laughs> can do a plug, absolutely. Um, if you're interested in Drupal 8 development, or you might be a Drupal 7 developer, and you want to know what's going on in Drupal 8, there's a session on Thursday at 1 o'clock. Uh, it's Drupal 8 in a nutshell. I'll be presenting with uh, one of my colleagues, Boris, and we give you a high-level overview looking at Drupal 7 code, what it looks like in Drupal 8. So come along to that. Okay. Steve, any last words? Yes. Have a great Sarah. conference and enjoy the beer. <laughs> <laughs> Mike? Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Glenn and, uh, and Mike for putting this together. I am hugely impressed at the quality of the advice given here um, and um, will actively be sharing like this the this whole thing because this re you guys really did spell it out um, and all the uh, the trailblazers I mean um, this like really hits it on the head as to like what's important um, you know how to get into this community and how to succeed so like yeah thank you thank you yeah th I mean, thank you to everybody including everybody who came and participated asked some great questions to help get us going so thank you to that um, yeah enjoy the conference have a beer. That's definitely great advice. <laughs> 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 and, and since I'm from Austin, go see the bats. Don't miss the bats. Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, thank you, and you know, be true to yourself, and uh, look for what's right, and don't, don't just take the first job. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right, well, thank you. I can't say anything better than that, so thank you very much. <laughs> Is it right there? <laughs>